Well, it's good to see you in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. My name is Charlton. If you are new around here, I'm so glad that you just showed up and just going to help us lift up the mighty name of Jesus today. Um, if you haven't gotten your free gift, if you're a guest with us today, there's some in the foyer just to see a pastor or one of the uh, welcome team out there. And, and we would love to know that you are here. If you will look around, you may be in a seat back. There's a green card there. If you would fill that out and just let us know you're here. Uh, or you can scan a QR code on the back of one of those chairs. And we'd just love to know um, who you are and how we might be able to uh, serve you as a church today. We're just going to sing some songs today that just remind us of the, the victory and the hope that we have through our mighty Savior, Jesus, today. So if you will, would you stand? Let's join our voices together and do that. Yeah. 
awesome and power forever. Awesome and great is your name. You overcame. You overcame. You overcame. chance to witness something uh, very awesome today so if you would have a seat and turn your attention over to the packy and the baptist all right thank you charlton uh, good morning it's good to see everybody this morning it's great to be greeting you from the baptistry again uh, i'm here today with cheney fulbright he's 17 years old he's made his profession of faith in christ but i was just thinking about something very significant uh, that i want to mention to you before it uh, it leaves my mind never in 22 years of student ministry at this church has i have i seen god saving the number of students that he has been lately. It is really remarkable and miraculous. So today we're, uh, we're celebrating Cheney's baptism, but I, I tell you, we need to be celebrating God's miraculous work in people's lives of all ages, but I just have never seen it like this. And so I'm thankful to be a part of that. Uh, when God does this kind of work, all glory goes to him. And so we're thankful uh, for him. So let me tell you about Cheney for just a minute while he's uh, standing here before you. Uh, first of all, he's got a big fan club here today. If you're here as a fan of Cheney's just for his baptism, raise your hand at us and let us know you're here. Uh, so he's got lots of friends and family here today, and he's got his mama backstage. So thank you all for being here. Uh, Cheney actually attended a, uh, a youth service at one of our sister uh, Baptist churches at Brown's Chapel Baptist Church a few weeks ago, and, uh, and he gave his life to Christ there. And, uh, and their youth director uh, sent me a message and said, hey, uh, there's this guy, Cheney Fulbright, that gave his life to Christ. He wants to be baptized, though, at Harvest because their family's been coming. And so she immediately let me know that God had worked in his life. And so I met with him over the last uh, week and a half or so, uh, and, uh, and we just confirmed that. And so today, Cheney's here to let you know he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation. And so he's experienced that miracle in his life. Maybe some of you are here this morning, and you'll watch his testimony of being buried with Christ and being raised to walk in a new life, and you'll say, you know, that really needs to be me. I need to give my life to Jesus. So uh, this morning we baptize Cheney. Cheney, have a seat. All right. Cheney, have you confessed Jesus is Lord? You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? And have you turned from your sin? Well, because you have, Cheney, it is a, a privilege of mine, really, to be able to baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. I know that Cheney's desires to live for the Lord. You guys be praying for him as he uh, begins his journey in that, okay? Charles? Well, the church is a family. Do you know what that means today? Is that Cheney's in the family of the Lord. So that means as a part of the church, he is our, now our brother in Christ. So get to know him, encourage him in his walk with the Lord. If you're here and you, like Cheney, have tasted the goodness of the Lord and taken hold of and accepted his grace and his mercy today, that's something worth singing about, isn't it? Amen. So if you would, let's stand together. And Join our voices again. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. On Calvary By God's word at last my sin I learned Then I trembled at the law I'd spurred Till my guilty soul imploring turned To Calvary There your mercy and your grace was free there your pardon multiplied to me there 
my burden so found liberty in Calvary. Now I've given Jesus everything. Now I gladly know him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only see. And your grace was free That drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. So found liberty the Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty the Calvary. to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary there my burden so found liberty at Calvary at Calvary gospel of Jesus is the hope of the ages burning brighter and brighter and standing forever oh the church he is building no nothing can stop it it's a city that's shining a light in the darkness Nothing can stop it. Yeah, here's the gospel. Though Christ was dead, now surely he is risen. Yeah, he's coming back again, and Christ will reign in triumph forever. This is our confession. 
conviction This is our conviction We believe what is written We believe what you've spoken Though Christ, though Christ was dead Now surely he is risen Yeah Hallelujah, church. Oh, sing hallelujah. Christ is our redeemer. Oh, shout making the way for us into eternity and a glorious future. All of our praise to you this morning. You are the only one worthy. Through the saving and the mighty name of Jesus, we can sing and pray and join together in fellowship today. It's what unites us. The name of Jesus we pray through his wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Good singing, church. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's thank the Lord for the praise team today, Charlton and these guys. They do a great job for us every week. What a great time of singing today. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, I hope you do. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. If you don't have a Bible or own a Bible, you can look at the seats there and you'll find Bibles there. We want you to be able to be in the Word while you're in here. And if you don't own a Bible, you can take that home. Just consider that our gift to you. You can take it home and that way you can be in the Word of God, not only in this room, but in your home. And if you've done that four or five times and you've got five or six of them in your car, bring them back. Somebody else needs them, okay? So uh, we, want, we want everybody to have a copy of God's Word. If you're joining us online or at home today, thank you for joining us. We're honored that you would choose to do that. And um, we just wish you the best and well. We hope that you've been blessed through this time of worship and that you'll just uh, hear God speak to you through this time in the Word. Now remember the day when my wife and I were married. I can take you back to the exact spot in the building at Providence Baptist Church between Leif and Marmaduke. And that day, we had been in a, an exclusive dating relationship. We had been engaged and promised to one another. But that day, we took it to a, a, a different level. You know, there's something about being promised to marry someone. But when you stand before a preacher and friends and God himself... And promise to love, honor, and cherish until death parts us, that's taking it to a different level. You know, and we did that, uh, man, it's been, golly, 25, almost 25 years ago. I came out really good in the deal. 
Like, I really, really did well for myself. I don't know what my wife would say about having to share a house in life with me for the last 25 years, but I, I did really well. I've always told her, you know, sweetie, if something ever changes and you decide to leave, just go ahead and pack me a bag because I'm going too. You know, like we're just not going to do this thing uh, apart from each other. But you know what wouldn't be a good thing? It's a really good thing to be married to my wife, but what wouldn't be a good thing is for me to have entered into a relationship with my wife and then continue to live as if I don't have a relationship with my wife. You know, for those of you who grew up in Paragould like I did, we used to cruise King's Highway. You know, some of you, if you're newer to town, we would, we would make laps from Dodge Store to the movie theater, which is where Battens is now. And, and uh, that may not sound like much fun, but it was really fun. You know, we would cruise town, we'd go up to King's Highway, and we'd cruise town, and, and before I was married to my wife, you know, I could, I could holler out the window at all the single ladies, you know, because that's just what everybody was doing, you know, I mean, but that wouldn't be a good thing for me to do anymore. It would not go well. You know, before I was married to my wife, I could go to the gym and, and be working out, and when the girls came around, you know, you trade the 25-pound dumbbells for the 45-pound dumbbells, you know, I mean, like, you can do that when you're a single man, but you know, now that I'm married, I shouldn't do those things. And so, like, now that I'm in a relationship with my wife, having a relationship with my wife, it influences other things in my life. And because I have a relationship with her, it would not be good if I continued to live like I don't. But, you know, my relationship with my wife is not the only game-changing relationship I've ever entered into. There was a time in my life when I gave my heart and life to Jesus. Now, I was raised a Baptist. I've been a Baptist for almost 46 years and nine months. My mom carried me to a Baptist church in the womb. I suppose I'll be a Baptist from the womb to the tomb. I I was born a Baptist, but there is a difference in being born a Baptist and being born again. See, being a Baptist, I could do on my own. I'm proud to be a Southern Baptist, but I could be a Baptist on my own. But I could never be born again on my own. So there's a difference in being born into a religion and being born again into a relationship with Jesus. And so I have a relationship with Jesus because just like there was a time when my wife and I came together and we exchanged vows and promised ourselves to one another, and that day we left that place in a relationship as husband and wife, I can go back to the place and time in my life when I gave my heart and my life to Jesus and said, Jesus, all of me to you, and I take all of you to me, and I asked him to forgive me and to save me and to come into my heart and my life and be my Savior and my Lord. And I have to confess to you today that since that day, I haven't always been faithful, but he has. I haven't always loved him well, but he has always loved me well. I haven't always done right. I haven't always held up my end of the bargain, but he has. And so just like it wouldn't be right for me to enter into a relationship with my wife and continue to live as if I don't, it's not good when people enter into a relationship with Jesus but then continue to live as if they don't have one. And the writer of Hebrews in our text today is writing to Jewish Christians who have believed that Jesus is the Messiah, but a part of their life is still acting as if they don't. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, the writer says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, it's inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Therefore, brothers and sisters, there is an old preacher saying that says, anytime you see the word therefore, you need to figure out what it's there for. As we have discussed, 
We can settle that age-old argument right here and now. Anytime you see the word therefore, I can tell you what it's there for. The word therefore is a transition word. It transitions from one line of thinking to another line of thinking. But there are different transition words. There are different conjunctions that connect thoughts and phrases, but some of them act differently, like the word and. It's a transition word that continues down the same line of thinking. You're just connecting these things, and, 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 and. The word but connects thoughts but changes directions. Like I was doing this, but I decided not to and did that. The word therefore, it connects thoughts. And so it's, it's connecting, but, but it's transitioning from one to the other. And this connection, when you see the word therefore, it always reminds us that it's the writer's way of saying, because I've just told you something that is absolutely true, because this is true, therefore, this is the intended result. So it connects and transitions, and the connection is based on a truth established in the first, therefore, this is the intended result. Like for some of you parents, you would say, I brought you into this world, and therefore, I can take you out of this world, right? Right? It's it's connected. But the writer is writing through all of these 10 chapters, and, and, and when we dive into verse 19, we do an injustice to the work that the writer did if we act as if the entire work just started at verse 19. We do an injustice to the tedious work, the exhaustive work that he put in writing this book if we act as if this passage just stands alone. We started with the word therefore, which means we have to know what was true before in order to know what therefore is there for. The writer has begun to write this book to Christian people, but they are Jewish Christians who have decided to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But believing that Jesus is the Messiah, they have still remained in some of their Judaism. And so they are living as if the way to heaven is Jesus plus Judaism. They are living as if the way to heaven is Jesus plus religion. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to them to set the record straight to let them know that the way to heaven is not Jesus plus religion. In fact, the way to heaven is not Jesus plus anything. The way to heaven is Jesus. And as he's writing about the supremacy of Christ and the primacy of Christ, he begins to talk about the ministry of Jesus Christ, how he came to be our sacrificial lamb. And he talks about how the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross accomplished what the blood of bulls and goats could never do. That Jesus, when he died on the cross, died once for all sin, once for all men. And after going to the cross and dying as our sacrificial lamb, he rose from the dead and sits today at the right hand of the Father, serving as our great high priest. And so as Jesus died to be our sacrifice and lives today to be our great high priest, the writer is bringing the reader through nine and a half chapters to two very important conclusions. First, the blood and body of Jesus have given us direct access to God the Father. Second, Jesus lives today as our great high priest. So I did you a favor. Like we just went through nine and a half chapters in about ten minutes. That's pretty good pace. Now the rest of it, we're going to slow down a bit. But the writer is bringing the reader to two very important conclusions. You see, under Judaism, once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would have to take the blood of an animal, and he would enter into what's called the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle in the temple was, it was separated by this heavy curtain, this veil. 
And once a year, the high priest would go behind the veil into the very holy of holies, and he would sprinkle the blood of an animal on the altar and there in the very presence of God. And, and, and the reason he would do that is because blood sacrifice was necessary to cover sin. The result of sin is death. Therefore, life is required to cover this tragedy that is punishable by death. And so once a year, the, great, the, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood around. And it was such a serious thing that if anything was wrong with the ceremony, if anything was wrong with the priest, if anything was wrong with the offering, the high priest would be killed on the spot. It was such a serious thing to come into the very presence of God that everything involved had to be holy. And it was such a serious event that the high priest would have bells on his outfit so that as he walked around, the bells would be jingling. And they knew as long as we hear the bells jingling, things are going okay. As long as the bells are ringing, the high priest is still alive. And he's still performing this ceremony and presenting this sacrifice. But it was so serious, no one but the high priest could go back there. So they would tie a rope around his ankle. So in case they heard the bells stop ringing, because God had killed the high priest, they could drag him out of there. Like, this is serious business. That's how serious God takes sin. That's how serious God takes sacrifice. And when the high priest would come out of the Holy of Holies, if the sacrifice was accepted, the ceremony and the high priest were acceptable, the high priest would come out from behind the veil, and when he would come out from behind the veil alive, it would tell the people sin has been atoned. Sin has been covered for one year. But the blood of Jesus Christ did what the blood of bulls and goats could never do. Jesus doesn't have to go back to the cross every time we sin. Jesus doesn't have to give his life again every time we do something we shouldn't do. Jesus died once for all sin, once for all men. The blood of Jesus accomplished what the blood of bulls and goats could never do. When Jesus went to the cross and gave his life and shed his blood so that our sins could be covered... And then after serving as our sacrificial lamb, presented himself before God the Father in the very holy of holies as our great high priest. And just as when the high priest would come out of the veil of the temple and him coming out alive would, would declare to the people that the sacrifice has been accepted and sin has been atoned for one year, when Jesus came alive out of the tomb... It declared to the world that the sacrifice had been accepted, that God was pleased, that sin had been atoned, and forgiveness was available not for one year, but forever. Jesus did that through his blood and his body on the cross. And because what he did on the cross was accepted to forgive sin, not for one year, but forever in Jesus, those who have traded sinful rebellion or prideful religion for a relationship with Jesus, they have direct access to God the Father. Now, I've been a preacher for a number of years, and, and people will say things to preachers, and I, I really... I'm honored that you think that highly of us. I tell people you don't have to hang around me very long to find out exactly how normal I am. But people will say, hey, preacher, I know you've got a special line to God. Would you pray for me? And I certainly will pray for you because if you need the prayers, I need the practice, I'll do that. But if you know Jesus Christ, you have the same line to God the Father that I do. Jesus paid just as much for you to be there as he did for me to be there. And so as a believer, as someone who has traded sinful rebellion or prideful religion for relationship with Jesus, we read these first nine and a half chapters and we come to this conclusion that the blood and body of Jesus have given us, have given me direct access to God the Father. 
And second, Jesus lives today as our great high priest. And because those two things are true, verse 19, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. Because the blood of Jesus has covered our sins, we can come in not claiming our righteousness, but his. And we can come into the very presence of God the Father, knowing that the one who sits at his right hand is our great high priest. And so as we come into the presence of God the Father, through the way that Jesus has inaugurated for us, through the curtain, that is the veil that is, is his flesh, when he said, it is finished on the cross, what was required for our atonement was finished, and when he said, it is finished, and breathed his last, the veil on the temple was torn from top to bottom, declaring to the world that what Jesus had done on the cross was enough to inaugurate for us a new way to God the Father. Because these two things are true, notice in the text that there are three things that we should do. You know, as Baptists, we have some traditions. One of those is that every good sermon is supposed to have three points and a poem. Right? Three-point sermon. Well, this text really just sets it up for that. I mean, like, if there's ever been a text that deserves a three-point sermon, it's this one. Because the writer's bringing the reader to the conclusion that if this is true of you, if you have a relationship with Jesus, notice verse 22, these phrases that earmark the points, let us. Verse 23, let us. Verse 24, and let us. These three let us statements when you read this text should jump out to you as Things that the reader is, is supposed to notice, that the writer is saying, hey, because this is true of us, because we know Jesus, because we have a relationship with Jesus, these things are true. We have direct access to God the Father, and Jesus lives today as our great high priest. And because all of this is true, therefore, let us do these three things. And there are three words in these three things that really jump out to me, because I've seen them somewhere else. It says in verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Verse 23, let us hold on to the confession of our hope. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good deeds. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. These three things remain. And the writer of Hebrews wants those who have a relationship to, with Jesus to know that these three things should remain. That these three things should be seen in your life. It should be heard in your life. Therefore, let us do these three things. Since we have traded rebellion and religion for a relationship with Jesus, let us draw near to our God, the writer says. To draw near to God with sincerity, with a true heart. If you like to take notes, mental notes or written notes, you can write that down as point number one. Since we have traded rebellion and religion for a relationship with Jesus, let us draw near to our God. That Jesus has bought us access to somewhere we could never get on our own. Now, I have some famous people in my family. We have some infamous people in our family and some famous ones in our family. One of my cousins that I grew up with is Cliff Lee. He pitches in the major leagues. I got a picture of Cliff up there. And Cliff and I, we grew up together our great-grandmas are sisters. Our moms sang together. I'm going to date myself here in Baptist life, but our moms sang together, Jackie, in the ladies' ensemble back in the day, you know. So our, we grew up together. Same church, same... There were three of Cliff and his older brother Chad and younger sister Kara, and then there were three of us boys, and we kind of all stair-stepped each other. But we grew up together, and, and as he pitched, I mean, I, I, I'm proud of him. You know, for making the major leagues. I mean, he started multiple World Series games for multiple teams. He started an all-star game as a, you know, as a starting pitcher for the American League all-star team one year. He won the Cy Young Award in the American League in 2008. I mean, that's the best pitcher in the American League, they said that he was in 2008. But when he would come to St. Louis and pitch, 
for the Phillies, we would go to St. Louis and we would watch him pitch. Or he, if it was on a day where the Phillies were in town but he wasn't pitching, we would still go so that we could connect with him and see him. And, and I've got another picture of he and I. This is downstairs in Bush Stadium outside the visitor's clubhouse. And so when we would go to watch Cliff pitch, you know, there's two guys in that picture. There's, one is uh, extremely talented and wildly successful. The other is me. And, uh, but sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. And what you can't see on that picture, my right hand that's behind his back, I've got this uh, bracelet on. When you would go to Bush Stadium, if you had um, you know, a player who was family or something and they would let you downstairs, they would give you these bracelets. And there's an elevator in the stadium that goes down to the floor where the clubhouses are. And there's some guards, there's some security people that stand outside that elevator. And if you walk up to that elevator to try to get on and you don't have one of those bracelets, you're out of luck. You don't get to go downstairs to the clubhouse. But if you have one of those bracelets on, it's on my right wrist that's behind his back. If you, if you have one of those bracelets on, you can approach the elevator with confidence. Because somebody you know is giving you access to that place that you couldn't have access to on your own. And so we would approach the elevator and show them our bracelet. And they would open the elevator doors and we'd go in. The person in the elevator, we'd tell them where we were going. We'd show them our bracelet. They'd hit the floor button and away we go. And then we'd go get to hang out for a little bit after the game. And they were usually catching a plane or something or heading out. But... We would get to visit for a few minutes. But someone that I knew gave me access to a place that I couldn't have gotten to on my own. And on a much grander scale, the blood and body of Jesus Christ has done the same thing for those who know him. That what Jesus did on the cross has given me access to a place that I could never get to on my own. Through religion, through my own good living, moral living, I could never make it to heaven. I could never be good enough to earn access to God the Father. But what I could not do on my own, someone that I know has given me access to that place. Because I know Jesus Christ is my Savior, because I I, I repented of sinful rebellion and and, and realized that it wasn't religion that would get me there, but it was relationship with Jesus, because I traded rebellion and religion, for a relationship with Jesus, I can draw near to God with a sincere heart. I can come before God the Father as His Son. That when I come to Him, He knows me and I know Him. And I come not because of who I am or what I've done, but I come because of what Jesus has done and who He is. And if you have traded rebellion and religion for a relationship with Jesus, I want you to know this morning that you don't need a priest to pray for you. You have direct access to God the Father. You have the same line to God the Father that the preacher has. As the writer says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. But also let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. To hold fast to our confession. My friend Jerry Horton is back here today, and we like to go to Lake Norfolk during the summertime and ride around. I I don't care if it's January in the duck woods or July on the lake. I like a boat ride. I mean, there's just something about it. It just I can check my mind out. I just like a good boat ride. Jeremy, you can relate to that, right? I mean, there's something good about a boat ride. And when we go to the lake and we're hanging out, there's a, a time in the day where everybody... You're either tired or hungry, but whatever you are, you vote for the same thing. Let's go anchor down and chill out for a little while. When we anchor down, we throw the anchor out, and the anchor kind of holds the boat in place. See, there are two things that a boat has. It has a propeller, and the propeller is designed to propel the boat, to move it from one place to the other. But the anchor is not a propeller. The anchor is a compeller. The anchor compels the boat to stay in the same place. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, For the love of Christ, it compels us. Since we have reached this conclusion, if one died for all, then all died. That those who know Jesus Christ in personal relationship, that we see in Jesus the one who died for us, and in his death we see his love for us. 
And since he died for us, we are willing to die to self to live for him. And so because of Jesus' love for us and our love for him, it compels us to stay in place. And the writer of Hebrews says, if you have traded rebellion and religion for a relationship with Jesus, one thing that should be true of you is that you hold fast to the confession of your hope without wavering. That means I should confess Jesus just as much on Monday as I do on Sunday. That I should talk about the hope I have in Jesus just as often in bad times as I do in good times. That I should let the world know how good Jesus is when everything's going my way or when nothing's going my way. That I should hold fast to the confession of my hope without wavering. As Paul talks about what compels us, it's Jesus' love for us and our love for him. Since we have traded rebellion and religion for a relationship with Jesus, when we look to the cross, we see the measure of his love for us. We know that he died for us. We know that he lives for us. And the one who died and rose again for us and lives for us today, we die to self to live for him. And whether things are good or bad, whether it's Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever day it is, the love of Christ, Christ compels us to hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. And the writer of Hebrews is talking about the supremacy, the primacy of Christ, that if you know Jesus, that the way to heaven is not Jesus plus religion, so we don't do good things so we will make it to heaven, But we do these things because we know Jesus. We don't do these things so that Jesus will love us. We do these things because Jesus loves us. And because he first loved us, we love him. So therefore, let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast to our confession. And third, where we really drill down in our area of focus today is that since we've traded rebellion and religion for a relationship with Jesus, let us encourage our brothers and sisters. He says, let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. I told you, I been a Baptist since I was in the womb. I have heard this verse a lot. I grew up in a religious culture. I grew up in a legalistic culture where this verse in Hebrews chapter 10 was not used as something to encourage you, but it was used as a stick to beat you with, it seemed. That if you weren't very faithful in church attendance, they were going to use this verse as a stick to beat you into submission. And I can tell you, as I've worked a long time in ministry, that people will not come to church long because they have to. But they will come when they really want to. And part of this verse is not teaching us to come together just so we can check some religious box that says... I did my God things this week. We come together. We don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together because when we come together, we are encouraged to love and good deeds. Simply put, I am a better Christian the more I am around you. And I hope that it's true that you feel more equipped to walk with Jesus and serve Jesus the more you are around me. And it tells us that when we come together, we are to consider one another. This blows the me church idea out of the water. That when I come to this place and with you people, I don't come together thinking, what's in this for me? I don't come to these gatherings and these functions thinking, what am I going to get? I come considering 
What can I give? That through the week, as I'm thinking about service, I'm, I'm thinking about my friend Ray Knoll, and I'm thinking, I wonder what I can do to encourage Ray in his walk with Jesus. You know, that as, I, as, as I'm thinking about services and sermon series and stuff, I'm thinking about David Wilcox and his wife Carla, and I'm thinking, you know, I wonder, I wonder what I could do to be an encouragement to them, to, to help them love Jesus well. You know, I'm kind of thinking about people in the room, and I'm I'm putting faces and names. I'm thinking about Andy, and I'm like, I wonder what I can do to help Andy in the good works that God has called him to do. And this is not a new thing. This is a really old thing, that we are better together. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. When we come together, we should be sharpened for life. We should be sharpened for love and good deeds. And the reason some Christian people in America today feel so dull in their walk with Christ and their work for Christ is they are not together with other Christian people enough to truly be sharpened for walking with Jesus and working for Jesus. Jesus said, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. We are commanded to love one another. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 2, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So when I look at this verse in Hebrews, boy, the writer, he did a good job here. He had... He had probably read some scripture. He had been to church. He was considering these things because when he said, let us consider how to encourage one another, to provoke one another, he didn't say, let us encourage one another to random things that we don't see anywhere else. But Jesus said, love one another. Paul said, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works And the writer of Hebrews, as he's writing to people who know Jesus, he says, if you know Jesus, this should be true of you. So since it should be true of us, when we come together as Christian people, let us consider one another how we can encourage, how we can sharpen, how we can help one another love Jesus well and serve Jesus well. So as we consider our mission, that we are one church with one mission, that our mission is to see people connected to God and connected to one another in Christian community that is the local church, the reason we do that is not so we can put numbers on a scoreboard or numbers into Little Rock and say, look how many people we had on Sunday. We are not trying to draw a crowd just so the world can look at Harvest Baptist Church and say, man, they've got something going. We are trying to make disciples and understanding the biblical principle that disciples are better the more they are together with other disciples, we have as our goal, as our aim, as our mission to see you connected to God and then connected to others. Because that's the way the Christian life is designed to work. So let us encourage our brothers and sisters. So our sermon in the sentence then, if you're a big idea person, is because we are connected to God and one another through Jesus, we should demonstrate sincere faith, steadfast hope, and shown love. So the invitation today really is twofold. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, maybe you were born into religion, you were born maybe a Baptist, maybe something else, and you've just kind of always came to church Try to be a good person. Try to do more good than bad. I want you to know that the way to heaven is not about doing more good than bad. The way to heaven is knowing Jesus. And today we would want to see you connected to God the Father through Jesus the Son. So whether you're walking in sinful rebellion, you're just kind of doing it your own way, going and doing your own thing, or whether you are trying to be religious enough to make it to heaven, the invitation is the same invitation that Jesus gave last week. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so whether you are carrying the heavy yoke of sinful rebellion or the heavy yoke of prideful religion, the invitation is come to Jesus.
And so if you've never come to Jesus, there's never been a time in your life when you have come to him and said, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to know you. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? Forgive me of those things. Come into my heart and my life and be my Savior and Lord. If you've never done that, then we would invite you today to come to Jesus. Trade the yoke of rebellion or religion for relationship with Jesus. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I I have a relationship with Jesus. The invitation to you is to consider those three things. How, How often do you confess the hope that you have in Jesus? How confident do you come before God the Father? How's your prayer time? How's your Bible study time? Is there time that you talk to God and is there time that you listen to God? How connected to God are you? How connected to others are you? Are you confessing your hope? Are you steadfast in that? And so I would ask you as Christians, church members, to just right now bow your head, close your eyes. And I would ask you to think around your Sunday school room. To think around your family dinner table. And just kind of ask yourself... What am I doing to encourage those brothers and sisters in their love for Jesus and their work for Jesus? Jesus, we thank you that what you did on the cross was enough. We could be born religious all on our own. We could certainly, certainly are born rebellious. Those are not the same as being born again. Jesus, if there's someone here today who needs to be born again, I pray that today they would make that step, that they would come to you and trade rebellion or religion for relationship with you. For those who have a relationship with you, Jesus, I pray that our life would look like these things that should endure, faith, hope, love. May these be the confession of our mouth. May these be the attitude of our heart. May these be the work of our hands. Faith, hope, and love. So Holy Spirit, we give you this time and ask that you would move and work whatever is true of a person. There's certainly something for us to consider this morning. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you need to be saved, this invitation is for you. We want you to come. If you need to follow Jesus in baptism or join our church, we want you to come. Maybe you need to surrender your life to ministry or missions if that's you we want you to come and make that public today what jesus is doing in your life maybe you just need to spend some time in the altar in your seat talking to jesus this morning and asking him what he can do through you to help you consider other people here in the church and that their connection to you will be to the growth of the kingdom and the glory of god whatever the lord is leading you to do this is the invitation say yes to God this morning. Would you stand? Would you sing? In the splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice And He wraps Himself to come to Jesus this morning and darkness tries to hide trembles at his voice trembles at his voice and how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how is a
God. Need to come for baptism or church membership today. This is the invitation. In age to age, he stands. And time is in his hands. Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end. Oh, the God is. Father, Spirit, the Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Oh, sing with me. How great is our God. sing it. And how great how great is our God. Amen. The song of the redeemed. What a wonderful sound. Don't let that be the last time today or this week that you tell someone about the goodness of God and the hope that's in Jesus. As I look around the room, I just consider the things that we've talked about today, and I see people in the room who are doing these things. We have a man in our church named Brent Johnson, and Brent went to the jail on Wednesday along with other men and women from our church. They go every Wednesday night, and they preach the gospel. Brent was sharing about the hope that is in Jesus. One of our church members sharing, confessing the hope that is in Jesus. And six men in the Green County Detention Center gave their life to Jesus Wednesday night because of his confession. Yeah, that's good. I see people in the church that are an encouragement to our staff. We appreciate the way that you consider ways to be an encouragement to us. It's not just haphazard that we see, that you call, that you text, that you do things for us, that you put some time and thought into considering how you can encourage us in the work that we do. And we appreciate that. And that should just be the habit of our church. Let it be said of us that those people love Jesus and, man, they love each other. If that's what our community says about us, we'll be doing some good things. So thank you for your attention and your attendance today. Packy's going to come here in just a moment. and. Close us out. I think uh, you, you have a presentation to make this morning, Packy. All right. So before he comes, just a couple quick things that, uh, that we want you to know. If you are a youth parent, there is a meal for youth parents soon as we dismiss in the student room. And so Packy's going to feed you lunch and just talk with you about some things going on in the student ministry uh, in this coming year. There's also an all-committees meeting today at 2. So if you serve on any of our committees, we will meet also in the student room at 2 o'clock today. We shouldn't be here too long. I'd say by 3 o'clock you should be finished. So remember those two things today. If that's you, we want you to be there. Packy, come close us out this morning. Give us some good news. All right, we'll do. And I'll do what I do quickly because some of you haven't seen the wasp that's been dive bombing over here. But I'm just going to tell you, if it dive bombs me while I'm talking to you, I'm stage diving out in the middle of all of you. So catch me, okay? Won't you have a seat for just a moment, okay? And I'll stand you up again in a second. I want to introduce you to uh, the Fulbright family, first of all. Eric and Vanessa, Cheney, won't you guys come on up and stand right in front of me? God's been doing a lot of great things in our church and bringing us all sorts of, uh, of good folks to, to join our army and our family. And so this morning, I want to introduce you to the Fulbrights. Uh, Cheney, you were introduced to just a moment ago as we baptized him. And so they're coming to be a part of our church. If you're excited about that, would you put your hands together and welcome them to Harvest? 
Great folks, and we, we look forward to getting to know them uh, more and more as the days uh, go by. And I told them, when you come, we want to be a blessing to you, but we also expect you to be a blessing to us and use your gifts to, to, uh, to uh, encourage the body too. So they agreed to do that, so we, we welcome you, okay? And then I want to introduce you to you Miss Charlie Wrinkle. Charlie, come on up, and her family, as many of her family as want to join her. Uh, Charlie's a sixth grader. I just mentioned to you a moment ago that God's doing this incredible work amongst our students, and he's saving a bunch of them. So Charlie's one of those. I told her the other day, she's got the greatest name ever, Charlie Wrinkle. I said, there ought to be a book called The Adventures of Charlie Wrinkle, you know, and you just follow her around and see what she does, and she does all kinds of awesome stuff. So, uh, so she wants to come and let you know that she's given her life to Christ and wants to be baptized. If you're excited about that, put your hands together. So, so good to have you, Charlie. Uh, it's, it's awesome to know that the Lord is no respecter of persons, that he works in, in people who are, who are adults, people who are students. He's always on the move, and we're so grateful he is here at Harvest, okay? I want to ask you guys to go on out the door. Uh, where'd Jason go? Can you leave us already? Yeah, oh, Char uh, there, there's, there's Josh. Y'all follow Josh right out those doors. He's going to take you where you need to be. As you guys leave, you be sure and stop by and uh, say hello to them and, uh, and give them a hug and tell them how glad you are that they're part of Harvest, okay? All right, let me ask you to stand again. Don't forget to go make a difference today. You've been called to be Christ's ambassadors. Go do that job well, okay? Let me, let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for uh, your love for us, and we're grateful that you have been in, in uh, the room with us. And, and our prayer is that as we've sung and as we've uh, listened to your word and as we go apply your word, that you give, get glory for all of that. Uh, Father, thank you for saving those who you've been drawn to yourself, and thank you for bringing people into our church. My prayer is that if there's someone here today still who has not given their life to Christ, that before they leave this place, that they would join your family by placing their faith in Jesus and confessing their sin and, and believing that you raised Jesus from the dead. We trust you to do that kind of a work, and we ask you to do that. Lord, use us as we leave, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great day.